Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for coming for this uh, great presentation. Um, my name is Peter Roos, and I am the executive director of the Mark Twain House and Museum. And looking around the audience, I suspect there might be a few of you that were old enough to live through JFK's assassination. I'm sure that all of you will have lived through 9-11. And a person's reaction to those events is highly personal. And those events imprint deeply on our souls. As witness to this fact, we always remember quite explicitly where we were when they happened and how we felt at the time. And we recite that location to others as further witness to the event. It's generally accepted that we cannot gain true historical perspective until 50 years and the passage of time have sorted things out. But there are exceptions. What our reaction was in the moment of January 6th is your own experience. But there can be no doubt, even now, after such a short span of years, that January 6th, on this date, was a moment in American history that will live on for generations, for good or ill, it will also define us as Americans during this point in time. Mark Twain was, among other things, early in his life, a, news, a newsman, a reporter. And as such, he was someone who thought about history. And he was one who reflected on his times, as most reporters do. He continued to ponder the state of America and Americans for the entire remainder of his life. He continued to take on controversial subjects, sometimes subtly, sometimes blatantly, and often very publicly. We embraced this opportunity to hear Stephen Sund, who was a key witness and participant in this history. I am not deaf to the fact that the events of January 6th remain a hot topic, and that there has been considerable back and forth on our social media platforms about tonight's presentation. But now is the time to listen and to hear the viewpoint of a significant player whom fate and duty paced, placed in the path of an axial point of American history. Museums are a place for civil discourse as well as a forum for new viewpoints, and we ask you to bear that in mind as we open our museum to you tonight to appreciate a perspective that will be new to you. A little bit about our speakers. Doobie McDowell has more than 30 years of experience in journalism, politics, and public relations. She was the best known political reporter in Connecticut for 15 years and hosted a renowned Sunday morning television interview program, which was the first stop for any politician seeking higher office. She also established the influential media blog, The Laurel, which is the go-to source for news about Connecticut journalism. Doobie has served on numerous nonprofit boards, including, I am happy to say, the Mark Twain House and Museum Board of Trustees for several terms. She has been advising clients on communication strategy since establishing McDowell Communications Group in 2006. Stephen A. Sund was the 10th Chief of Police for the United States Capitol Police from June 13, 2019 until January 8, 2021. Before joining the United States Capitol Police in 2017, Sund had a 25-year law enforcement career working for the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, DC. There, he rose in the ranks from patrol officer to commander of the elite Special Operations Division. As commander, he led planning for numerous high-level security events, including four presidential inaugurations, and oversaw a number of specialized units including the Emergency Response Team, Special Events Dignitary Protection Branch, and Explosives Ordnance Disposal Unit, and many others. It is my pleasure to bring Doobie and Stephen to the stage. Thank you. Welcome, Chief Sund, to the Mark Twain House and Museum. It's great to have you here and so meaningful to have you here today, especially. And this is such a painful anniversary 
for the country, I can't begin to imagine how you feel. Thank, well, thank you very much for being here. It's been, one, a very long day for me, but um, I, I will say, and I know this is being live streamed, I know I've got a couple of Capitol Police officers watching today, and you know um, they went through a lot that day. When you look at the video, you look what happened, and you know, people I know will out there will say it was no 9-11, it was no Pearl Harbor. Well, it wasn't no walk in the park either. Uh, it was a very tough day. My officers were, were bloodied and beaten. Uh, and the sad thing is, it was majority by fellow Americans. Uh, and we are better than that as a country. We really are. Our moral uh, um, bar seems to have been lowered considerably on that day. But uh, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, from, from January 6th, and that's why I sat back and I wrote the book. But it, it is. It's a painful day. I've talked to numerous uh, Capitol Police officers throughout the day, retired, current, about what they're going through as we celebrate, well, I celebrate, we recognize this anniversary. Uh, and everyone has their own little story to tell. But one thing I keep hearing from the officers is they can't watch the images and they just wish January 7th would come. Well, for those who have read the book and those who are going to read the book, it it is gripping. It is chilling to read the narrative, I mean, it was chilling to watch it on television, but to go through it from your perspective is, is even worse. Um, can we just start by hearing what makes the Capitol Police un unique? Because that plays into a lot of the narrative of that day. And I appreciate, appreciate your comments about the, the quality of the book. Anybody, anybody that's writing when your book finally goes out there, you're you're really nervous as heck about what people are going to think about it. And that, and that means a lot. I'm not you know, trying to write a thriller. I'm trying to write something that we can learn from. Um, but I'm sorry. It, I, well, I was going to say it was a nonfiction thriller. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I was just wondering what, what, if you could describe what makes oh, Capitol yeah, yeah. the Capitol Police unique. unique. I'm sorry. Um, so people need to realize you have a number of law enforcement agencies throughout the country. You have the DEA, the Secret Service, the FBI, the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Those are all part of the executive branch. So in the legislative branch of government, we have one law enforcement agency. It's the United States Capitol Police. We're responsible for uh, protecting the 535 members of Congress and the whole legislative process. It's a very unique agency. Um, we, you know, we ex we're exempted from FOIA. We have uh, about 1,890, I'm sorry, about 1,845 sworn officers, 300 and I think on January 6th, about 360 civilians. That total put me right about 2,229, give or take a few uh, total employees. That'd be about the 25th largest police department in the country. A lot of people are very surprised to hear the Capitol Police are that large. But if you've been to Washington, D.C., the campus is a pretty large, complex campus with a number of, of posts that need to be um, protected, but we also protect the leadership. You know, we have eight on the Senate side, eight on the House side, and we travel with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's a sig significant amount of work. But what makes the Capitol Police unique and played a considerable role on January 6th is our oversight structure. You know, I'm, I have a, a police department that reports, I'm, I'm the chief of police, so you think, okay, hey, the top dog, he's the person that's gonna make the security decisions. I have 30 years law enforcement experience. Uh, I've handled active shooter situations. I've handled numerous major events. Um, I come with a magnitude of experience handling demonstrations, things like that. So when they bring me in to be the chief, I think I'm going to be able to be the chief of the police. They have a Capitol Police Board that oversees me, and they control a lot of what I do. But what's unique about it is there's a ser sergeant arms from the Senate side and a sergeant arms from the House side that are politically appointed positions. They're, position, they're appointed by the Speaker of the House and um, McConnell from the, from the Senate side. So they have a slant toward making sure that their, their bosses are going to be happy. So you got to realize, so now I'm reporting to a board that is uh, appointed by the House and Senate. But there's a third member. So there's four people on the Capitol Police Board. I'm the fourth. I'm a non-voting member. Keep that in mind. I have no vote in, in how I'm going to run. But I'm a fourth member. The third member is the architect of the Capitol, and this is going to surprise everybody because we're the legislative branch. He's appointed by the executive branch. He was appointed by Donald Trump. He's appointed uh, Brett Blanton. He's appointed by Donald Trump. So let's let's make it a little more interesting because now we have a really we have a strong political uh, entity that oversees a law enforcement entity. Uh, well, 
they, imp they implemented a, a law that affects when I can uh, call in federal resources, either before an event or during an event. And this is going to come into play on January 6th. I am the only police department in the country, the only chief in the country, that has a federal law. It's a federal violation for me to go and say, hey, I need National Guard support and before an event without first going without first going to the Capitol Police Board and saying, I need your approval. So if I'm going to do it before an event, it gets even better. They then have to go to leadership and get their approval. So think about that. That's just a recipe for disaster. I've got experience in, in law enforcement. I've got experience in security. Guess what they have experience in? <laughs> well, when you see what's going on on the Hill today, you might wonder, you know. Um, we'll and keep that, that in mind in because those are the people that oversee my police department. So, you know, I have to go to them to get approval, and they know politics. They don't know security. So it's a recipe for disaster. But it gets even better. On top of that, I have what's called four oversight committees, two on the House side, two on the Senate side, that, again, are all staffed by political appointees and people that represent specific political parties. So it's a recipe for disaster. That's unlike any other police department around. Congress has a lot of control over the police department. And whenever I'd go down and I'd, I'd do my um, budgetary, uh, I'd go and have to you know, fight for my budget and uh, go down and do my budgetary meetings, I always made sure I pointed out a couple of things. One, I was two to 300 officers short coming into January 6th. You know, I said I was the 25th largest police department. You should think that's plenty to do the job. Everybody knew I was already 300 officers short, which means officers are having to work significant overtime to fill some of these spots. They're having to work extra days off to fill some of these spots. So it affects me in a couple different ways. My officers are going to be a little more fatigued, and I'm worried about that. But how I can get my officers into training. If my officers are already overworked and I'm having to send people to you know, just fill overtime spots to fill all my spots, it's hard for me to send officers to go to training as much as I need to because we keep pulling them away. So it begins to get very convoluted. Now, I, I'm not going to sit here and make excuses. We did the best we can. We you know, got them out there. and we did, we did really good. And I think we could have done a whole lot better on the 6th and prevented it. And we'll get into that in a little bit when we begin to talk about intelligence failures and failures with the with the military because we'll go into that a little more so and that gives you a little idea of the the structure of the police department right and and that that goes exactly to um what readers of the book will be screaming as you read um why can't he why won't they listen to him why won't they let him uh call in the national guard we'll get to that in a minute but first the other thing is that you did not seem to have access to m much of the intelligence that would have given a, you a sense of what was coming. You know, a few days after, it's like, oh, we, we knew it was going to be, you know, we knew what was happening on the internet. We knew they were going to be coming. But it sounds like you didn't have access to much intelligence. Could you talk about the intelligence first? And then we'll get into the National Guard. Absolutely. So any police department out there is going to kind of organize their operations and uh, manage their operations based on intelligence. It's an intelligence-led policing. They're going to get intelligence and they're going to say, we're going to deploy, we're going to develop an operations plan. We had had a couple of previous MAGA events. Everyone knows that. You know, they had the MAGA 1. I'll call it MAGA 1. November, they had a big rally for Stop the Steal November. We got our intelligence. We based a plan on the intelligence. Successful. Everything went fine. We knew we were going to have people that may be armed. We knew we may have some militia show up. We knew the Metropolitan Police Department, which is one of our partner agencies. Um, anybody here been to Washington, D.C. before? <laughs> okay, everyone. Okay, good. Fantastic. Washington, D.C. has about 37 law enforcement agencies. It's a very complex city, but not much happens in Washington, D.C. without a lot of coordination between the law enforcement agencies. So the next biggest agency, well, actually bigger than me, is Washington, D.C. Police. They're the, the city agency. Um, so we do a lot of planning with them um, coming into it. It's been a long day. I'm, I'm sorry. Right. I'm really but the, you didn't have the yeah. So the, the so so the intelligence. So as you're coming into the the intelligence um, for it, we get intelligence from uh, a, ver a variety of resources. We're a consumer of intelligence. We're not part of what's called the intelligence community. We get intelligence from FBI and DHS. I've done a number of major events in Washington D.C. When we have a big event that has a threat stream, anything similar to what we we're seeing that I now know we we're seeing on January 6th, the FBI usually would do an executive briefing where they're calling in all the chiefs to say, hey, we're seeing some real concerning intelligence. They would do a joint intelligence bulletin with the DHS, or they'd at least do a conference call. None of that was done on January 6th. 
uh, we didn't get any of that. There was um, intel that was coming in. I now know the FBI was pushing some intel over to our, um, our Capitol Police intel unit, but they weren't going out and proactively doing what's called an intelligence assessment. They didn't identify the Capitol as possibly a threat, possibly being a, identified as a threat by either by domestic or foreign extremists. And as, as such, they didn't start what's called uh, an assessment, start gathering more proactive gathering of intelligence. You know, everyone now, how many people look out and go, hey, you could have seen that coming at you, and I talk about it, like a gray rhino running right at you. Hindsight is a lot cl very clear, but again, I have to base my planning on what my intelligence division is getting, giving me. So we're seeing this intelligence. Now, you know, DHS has done, their inspector general did a, re a review, said, yeah, we, we could have done better. We didn't push out enough intelligence. We didn't put out any shared documents. 20 minutes into the attack, man, I was attacked at 1253 on the West Front. 20 minutes into that attack, the DHS is sending uh, notices over to the Pentagon saying, no illegal activity in Washington, D.C. You know, you gotta ask yourself, how, how is this happening? They're, you're watching the same stuff on TV I'm watching. So DHS is also, you know, everyone remembers 9-11, you just talked about it. After 9-11, they formed the Department of Homeland Security. Why did they do that? To connect the dots so we would never have another 9-11. So all the different, you know, um, disparate intelligence sources could all come together, form you know, a good combined intelligence product, and be pushed to the people that need it. We learned our we thought we learned our lessons on, on after September 11th. It repeated itself on January 6th. You know they're now seeing that there's disparate uh, intelligence. It wasn't coming up. My intelligence unit I now know had significant intelligence that wasn't put into four intelligence assessments. You know the first all four intelligence assessments said it's going to be very just like the first two mag events. The last one said people were going to stay in their, their assigned locations and not even march. So I, I, I can't understand why it got watered down like that. I wasn't even invited to the last final assessment, uh, the um, briefing they had. But even the briefing didn't show that there was a coordinated attack, which we now know uh, was being planned. Uh, so we had ill-prepared uh, planning based on ill, uh, bad, bad intelligence, and we now see what existed out there. What's concerning, I talked about the 18 uh, um the intelligence community is made up of 18 agencies. Um, nine of those agencies are military intelligence agencies. Everybody, everybody's heard of General Milley, right? They see him up there, you know, big, you know, with all the stars, all the brass. He's the uh, 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 chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's the lead advisor to the President of the United States. The Secretary of Defense on uh, September uh, 6th was uh, Miller, Secretary Miller, uh, Secretary of Defense Miller. Both of them now, in doing my research, I found had significant concerns for violence at the United States Capitol on January 6th. Such significant concerns they had talked about in internal cabinet meetings locking down the capital city. Has anybody heard that? Yeah, you, know, you have now, yeah, I've heard it now. I didn't hear it before January 6th, I would have liked to. Um, they had talked about it, and they talked about ways that they could revoke the permits for, for demonstrations taking place on Capitol grounds. You know who signs those permits, who approves them? I do. You know who didn't get that, that information about their concerns? Me. So my intelligence unit actually reviews all the permits that come in. And most of them were uh, reviewed and uh, for me to sign, I think we had six groups that were permitting, and they give me a recommendation to approve, disapprove, whether it's gonna be what high level of uh, civil disobedience, you know, improbable, low. All of them came up with a low probability of civil disobedience or arrests. Hindsight being what it is, how could that have happened? So. I signed the permits, all, all, the, all the chain up the way says go ahead and sign these permits. We sign the permits, we have the groups come up to, uh, to demonstrate. Um, so that's kind of the, how the intel played out. It was ill, you know, intelligence failed operations. The um, inspector general for uh, the United States Capitol Police and their follow-up, you know, came out and made that, that finding um, that, you know, the, the intelligence had failed our operations, but it, it continues to get, get worse than that. So when you talk about Department of Defense, we'll go into that in a sec. Right, and, and when they make a major motion picture out of this, um, I mean, as I was reading this, it was it just it, felt it, like it is very gripping. And I'll tell you, you know, we, we'll talk about intelligence, we'll talk about oversight, we'll talk about the, the role that played, we'll talk about Department of Defense, we'll talk about. I'm sure we're probably going to talk about my my conversation with the Pentagon. There's so much more. I don't mind talking to you about this because there's still a whole lot more in this book. Um, there is. There's, you know, stuff about the calls from the White House, the, you know, going down brief and Pence, and I doubt we're going to get to that in this time period, but there's so much that ties it together, and the big trick here was taking this 
disparate you know the the oversight the intelligence the department of defense and putting it into something that you now say is is gripping i didn't write this to be you know wow a thriller and stuff like this no, yeah. i wrote it to be yeah. something that law enforcement can learn from and prevent this from happening again because what i saw my men and women go through i never want to see again i never want to see any chief having to put up with that and then within 24 hours having to be ridiculed having to be told i was racist complicit com i allowed people in and I'm happy to talk about all the videos that you saw my officers allegedly, you know, opening gates, um, because it shouldn't have happened. We shouldn't have ha had that happen. Um, so that's that's why I wrote it. But I appreciate the fact that you think it, it it's an interesting read. Oh, ab absolutely. And one of the, you know, really heartrending moments or heartbreaking moments is when the day after this, uh, Speaker Pelosi asks for your resignation, and I. As a reader, I kept saying he couldn't get the national, he couldn't get the approval to call in the National Guard. And the, and, and if I, I think I have this correct, you, the Virginia State Police and the New Jersey State Police came and helped you before you could even get the National Guard. Right. So what, what's interesting is, you know, I talked about the two laws that were tying my hands about calling in federal resources. At 1253, when we get hit on the West Front, you know, I, I immediately I see it happening. At 1255, I called the Washington, D.C. Police Department. Uh, I had coordinated with them. I used to work with them. I know how they deploy their resources. I had talked to them ahead of time and said, hey, by any chance, could you just have some of your folks in the area just in case we, we, we need them? Because I was just concerned about how many officers I had on my perimeter. Um, they were there. Anybody watch the video where you saw those officers come streaming in with the black and yellow uh, Jacksons and the bicycle helmets? Those were the MPD bicycle officers. Thank God they were there because this would have been far worse if they hadn't gotten there within minutes. Um, so we had planned that ahead, uh, ahead of time. Um, I'm sorry. Um, oh, so, oh, yeah, yeah, so National Guard, National Guard, I'm sorry, it's been a very long day. So National Guard, so at 1258, I make my first call to the Capitol Police Board to get that approval for National Guard because I see the thousands of people that are all streaming up uh, and, and fighting with my officers. I pick up the phone, I call Paul, uh, Paul Irving, who's the House Sergeant Arms at the time, uh, and ask for the uh, authority to call the, the uh, uh, National Guard. At the time, he tells me, I'll run it up the chain, and I'll call you right back. Click, a, hang up the phone. Um, 71 minutes I had to wait. 71 minutes. Now, I didn't just sit there going, let's see, okay, 71. Call after call after call. I make about 36 calls. To law enforcement agencies, I get 1,700 law enforcement agencies to give me assistance um, before I can get the uh, before I can get the National Guard. People need to realize when law enforcement is overwhelmed and we have used all our resources and we need additional support and we pick up the phone and dial 911, it goes to the National Guard. There's a process. There's a there's a directive from the Department of Defense, and I talk about it in here. And I try and make it as as you know easy to understand. It's called the Defense Support for Civil Authority. It has a number of different ways I can get assistance, but it has one key way. It's called emergency authority. That when, and it reads like a textbook of what was happening on January 6th when there's unexpected civil disobedience that disrupts government um, um, operations. And it, it, it's, it's scary the way it reads. They are to provide me immediate assistance while they seek presidential approval. Okay, keep that in mind. So 1258, I call the Sergeant Arms. I wait my 71 minutes at 209. Okay, 209, I finally get the approval from the Capitol Police Board to go ahead and call the military. Now, meanwhile, that fight's been raging on the West Front. Okay, you've all seen it. It's getting, you know, the officers keep backing up because we're way outnumbered. When I say 58 to 1, it's 58 to 1. Can you imagine battling like that? Um, so they keep backing up, and they keep getting pushed back because thousands of people are now streaming onto the West Front fighting with my officers. At one point, we had almost 10,000 people on the West Front. They keep pushing them back, pushing them back. We get closer and closer and closer. Everyone's seen the video of the guy with the police shield smashing it through the window. That happened 80 minutes after they hit our west front. Think about that. 80 agonizing minutes that the officers were out there fighting, defending every inch while, you know, I'm trying to get all the resources in. I'm trying to fight for the National Guard. So 209. I get the approval for the National Guard. 212, I think, is uh, Pozella was the uh, protester that put the uh, shield through the window, puts it through the window. I'm coordinating the resources coming in. And then I get notice that the National Guard wants me to call the Pentagon. 234. All right, 
cavalry's coming. Let me, let me make this call. I pick up the phone. It's just been a long day. So I pick up the phone. I'm <clears throat> let, me, let me set the stage. No, 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 we're good. Let me set the stage. Because it's a room probably about this size. Video screens all along the front of the room. A little darkened. We kept it a little cold because of all the computer equipment. It's the operations center. I'm sitting at a, a, a circular table at the, at the front, a U-shaped table. And I'm watching this going on in front of me. I pick up the phone. I get on a conference call with the uh, Pentagon. And they say, we understand you need emergency assistance. I said, I need everything you've got. Send me whatever you've got as, you, as, as quick as you can. It's an emergency. My officers need your help. It's an urgent, urgent. I remember saying that twice. The person on the other line is a lieutenant general uh, from the Pentagon. And he tells me, quote, I don't like the optics. They're concerned about the look. I don't like the optics of the National Guard on Capitol grounds. I'd much rather you know, relieve some of your officers on traffic post so you can send your officers into the fight. I said, I don't have that opportunity. Everybody's in the fight. I need whatever help you can give me. No, nope, don't like the optics, stuff like this. Now, mind you, the mayor of Washington, D.C. is on the call. The uh, chief of Capitol Police is on the call. There's a bunch of other military that are on the call. So they have all backed up my story. And the military, the person the general I was talking to, the inspector, lieutenant general, denied it at first. Um, are repeatedly saying, I need your help. I'm begging my officers. Aren't they watching, aren't they watching they television? They are watching the same, when I say the same screens, they're watching national TV. They're seeing the fighting that's going on. And I'm begging for their assistance, literally begging that I need their help. And the guy turns, the guy after saying it several times, I said, I don't have that as an option. I don't, I can't <clears throat> leave officers off traffic post and send them in. And he turns to me, I'll never forget, he goes, my recommendation is not to support your request. Robert Conti, <laughs> who's the chief of the Washington, D.C. Police Department, and, and I've known him for years, and he had just become the chief on uh, January 2nd, because I talk about how I reached out to him January 2nd, 2nd to congratulate him, and he was the acting chief. I still remember this to this day. He goes, whoa, 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 hold on, General. Are you telling me you're not going to support the Capitol Police? And the General goes, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. He goes, but that's what you just said. And he goes, no, I just don't like the optics. So we're back to that again, and I'm telling him I, I don't have people to relieve, stuff like that. It got so bad, the mayor said, we're going to the press. And he said, please don't. Well, look, the mayor's office put out a tweet saying they're refusing to help. Um, finally, he gets off the phone. Well, before he gets off the phone, sadly to say, at 2.43, I hear in the background, shots fired in the Capitol, shots fired in the Capitol. At that point, still on the phone, I'm mad as hell. I tell him, there's shots fired in the Capitol. Is that urgent enough for you now? I said, I got to go. I hang up the phone. We had the shooting of um, Ashley Babbitt inside the, uh, the Capitol at that point. Uh, so I had to reach out to the Capitol Police Board, start making notifications, start handling that, not knowing if the military was going to come. And I said, that was 2.43. Do you know what time the military finally showed up on the Capitol grounds? 5.40 p.m., we had the uh, National Guard finally uh, show up on Capitol grounds to be sworn in because we have to swear them in as uh, special police officers to help us out. That's just part of the part of the By law. Way, I just want to add for those who haven't read the book yet, you were requesting the National Guard uh, days in advance th to yeah. have the ability to call them up. So it's not like you just at you know that day. Thought yeah, about they, the they had an Guard. idea that that we that I may be calling them. So what happened was what you're referring to is on January 3rd. You know, I, I've handled a number of events. I knew when we have a joint session of Congress, again, we didn't have any intelligence saying there was going to be a, 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 a developed a, a coordinated attack on the Capitol. When we have a joint session of Congress, it requires a significant staffing inside the Capitol. We've got a number of posts that need to be uh, staffed. We have to, uh, we have the vice president there. We have to be ready to escort the, the Senate back to the Senate chamber so they can have their debate if there's an objection to the vote, which we knew was going to happen. Uh, so we, it takes significant staffing. I had a large metal perimeter, a, a steel barricade uh, perimeter around the, uh, the Capitol that I knew that would be my biggest vulnerability. If anyone's going to come up, we're going to have large crowds around. That's where someone's going to want to try and jump over the fence or then, you know, I'm going to have any problems. So all I wanted, all I wanted was unarmed National Guard. We've used them up there before to help stand the perimeter so no one just gets stupid and tries to jump over the fence. So on, September, on January 3rd, I went and requested that, and I was, I was denied over, guess what, the concern, the look of optics, the look of the National Guard. On, uh, on Capitol grounds. So I was denied by Paul Irving, the uh, House Sergeant Arms. I was also, you know, the uh, uh, Senate Sergeant Arms also uh, would not approve the request. So we had to go into January 6th without 
the support that I, I, I would have liked to have had. You managed to be uh, very nonpartisan in the book. Um, you had had good experiences with <clears throat> um, uh, former President Trump, with, jo with Joe Biden. I mean, you really are very down the middle, but you, during the course of your narrative, you show us as you're doing your timeline at what point uh, Trump's tweets came and what they said. And so can you talk about that a bit and the role that you think um, the ex-president played? I'm happy to do that. And I'm glad you pointed out the, the, the part about a, a, apolitical, unbiased writing. Personally, I think as, as a public servant, somebody that's out there defending you know, whoever's First Amendment demonstration rights are, and I, you know, I'm a firm believer, First Amendment is extremely important, especially in Washington, D.C. You, know, you have to be able to go and voice your, grie your, uh, your grievance peacefully to your, your elected members of Congress. So I, I support that 100%. You should never really know when you're being pulled over or being pulled over or, or someone's you know, handling a, a demonstration or coming to your house, what the political leanings of a police officer is. It doesn't matter. You should get the exact same level of service no matter who you are and no matter what the, what, what the issue is. Um, so I try and write this as a apolitical, unbiased, just like I police, because that's how we got to learn. If I'm going to write it with a political slant, it's immediately going to be written off by one side or the other as, oh, that's just, you know, that, that's, uh, that's a Trumpster or oh, that's a never Trumpster. That's not how I want to do it. You should never, you should never know my political leaning because it'll, it'll affect the quality and the importance of the book. So the reason why I, I put that in there is because I think it plays an important role. You know, a lot of people are like, well, you know, hey, this was a stolen election. Stolen election, non-stolen election, whatever it is, you know, if, if the Trump administration thought that the election was going to be stolen, my, my thought is, why not have everybody out there collecting all the evidence you need and if you have the evidence, take it to court like it, they, they tried on a couple occasions, and they just didn't have the evidence coming into January 6th, but they still called together this last um, protest. You know, if they hadn't called together the last protest and gone down there and said, hey, if you don't fight like hell for your you know, country, you're not going to have a country, based on non-evidentiary support for something, we wouldn't be here. Um, so regardless of what it is and who you voted for, it's now coming out that, you know, members of his own cabinet were trying to tell him, members of his own you know, family saying, hey, you know, this may not be the, uh, the time and place for it, but that didn't have to happen. Right. So the reason why I put it in there is I, I think it's a critical part of the timeline. What, oh. you know, what was the perception down at the executive branch? 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is 16 blocks from the White House, um, from the Capitol. I think it plays an important role as we go through what's happening you know, up on the Capitol and what's happening down at the executive branch with the tweets coming out. Because the president is the commander in chief. As I had said, for emergency authority, technically, and we'll, we'll go into what the IG said when we're done here in a sec, he should be the one approving the emergency response of the National Guard. They should be coming, but ultimately, they, while they're responding to my assistance, they, he, they should be seeking his approval. Well, and as you said, as you wrote, the law and order president allowed the attack to go on. And that's, I think that's what you know, concerned a lot of officers. You know, he was known as law and order president. And I talk about the 2020 uh, protests you know, the um, courage under fire, the reason why it's called courage under fire is because police officers have gone out there, they've taken a lot of ridicule, a lot of criticism, not just for January 6th, being complicit, compl um, racist, stuff like that, but over, you know, the summer of 2020, they had the, the protests and things like that. And, you know, over time, police were made out to sometimes be the ill of society. So, but they're still out there, they're answering the call for service. They're answering, you know, they're, they're out there doing what they need to do. So that's kind of you know the reason why I call it courage under fire because they're still out there doing their job, which is important. Um, so I think when you look at the the role of the executive branch, I as the chief would have loved to have had, you know, um, the president sending some resources my way. You know, I I, I got a call and I, I don't want to you know have too many spoiler alerts. You know, I did I do talk about looking down on my phone and getting a, an odd number coming in and knowing yeah this is this is one of those numbers that's going to be from someplace pretty important and it turned out to be the White House but I'll let you read that and find out who it was. Right. Um. <laughs> um, you know, turning, turning to the present, um, you know, today, uh, with many things about actually today, um, the Presidential Citizens Medal, you know, given to 12 people who defended democracy on that day. And as someone who had just read this book, you know, I felt really sad that 
you were not there and I wondered how you feel about that. The important thing, and, and I'll go back to the Congressional Gold Medal, the important thing is the people that were out there sweating the blood, sweat, and tears for that 80 minutes on the West Front, fighting the group, keeping them from trying to get into the Capitol, and then fought until we could regain control of the Capitol about 6 p.m. They're the ones that deserve it. They're the ones that got it. That's the important part. I'm, you know, I'm more worried about my officers. That's the important part. But one thing I want to wrap up real quick, because I saw your looks as you were talking and listening about how the Department of Defense responded, you know, how the intelligence failed. The Department of Defense Inspector General did a big research into the um, military's response to January 6th. Do you know what their finding was? It was appropriate. Take it, read it. It's online. You can go online and look it up. That The response was appropriate because they didn't have a, a developed timeline for how fast the military should respond to uh, an issue like that. Keep in mind, in Washington, D.C., the capital is in the center of the city. The headquarters of the D.C. National Guard is east of the capital two miles. You ready for the kicker? 150 National Guardsmen with all their ride gear was with an eyesight west of the capital, anywhere from a half mile to two miles. They took those National Guardmen, allowed them to go back to the armory while they sent the evening troops to come and give my officers assistance when the fighting was all over. And they think that's appropriate. Have, have they changed any of the federal laws that tied your hands? That's a, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, one, so at the beginning of this, I talked about how I have a, a law that prevents me from calling in resources uh, either in advance or during an attack. Okay, that's 2 U.S.C. 1970, 2 United States Code 1970. Um, they changed one part of it. In an emergency, the chief of the Capitol Police now can go and call in federal resources without having to go to the Capitol Police Board. But there's an interesting aspect. They made it revocable. So if Congress or leadership says, hey, I don't like the look uh, or the optics of National Guard or whoever you're calling in, I'm revoking that authority. So again, it's politics trumping um, security. So it, it's just interesting. It's just how politics work. Uh, it's, it's sad because I don't want to see this happen again. Um, but unless we go and we realize what happened with intelligence, you know, the, the security structure on the Hill and, you know, get the Department of Defense to, to get out of being swayed by politics. And I talk about why I think the Department of Defense did what they did. And it was clear. Um, um, Miller, the Secretary of, the, uh, Secretary of Defense, makes it clear. He goes in and testifies. He says, there's no way I was going to put National Guardsmen anywhere near the Capitol. I wasn't going to put them um, east of 9th Street, which is you know where they were. They were over by the, uh, the White House. Because he was afraid that, the, one, it could incite the crowd, but two, he was afraid that President Trump may try and invoke the Insurrection Act. Uh, so that was part of my, my reason why I feel that this just came, you know, just completely um, digressed into a, a, just a completely disorganized mess. What was it that you think, I'm now going back after I said I was going to go to today, but what is it that you think prevented members of Congress from actually dying because we've heard many people say, and I think you say in the book, that that was a very real possibility. I think it, I think it was a very real possibility. You saw some of the people in the crowd. You saw how they were acting. Uh, you saw how they were violently fighting with my officers. I couldn't have imagined if they had trapped a member of Congress, especially a high-profile member of Congress, somewhere in one of the hallways, somewhere in an elevator, somewhere trying to, as they're trying to escape. And I attribute you know, the fact that none were, you know, think about it, not a single member of Congress was injured or killed, okay? So when people look at my officers and go, you guys, you guys failed that day, you guys didn't, my officers did not fail that day. They did not fail that day. They did their mission and not a single member of Congress was injured. So what do I attribute, uh, attribute that to is the Metropolitan Police Department, how quickly they arrived and the fact that we could delay them from entering into the Capitol for 80 minutes. During that 80 minutes, we started to get more resources. You know, the, the Virginia State Police, Fairfax County, Arlington County. And you talk about them getting the award. I think it's, I think it's good. You know, the Congressional Gold Medal got issued to all the law enforcement that responded. The 12 that got de uh, designated today was from Metropolitan and Capitol Police along with some civilians. Um, they just need to recognize it was a much larger force. Every single one of those officers that came from other jurisdictions, uh, Washington, D.C. Police and Capitol Police. Hopefully they're all included in spirit mm -hmm. in that because they all played a critical, critical role. 
many people here have been watching a little bit of um, cable news in the past few days. There's so many ironies about, I think, what's going on. Um, you and your fellow officers you know, were, in a sense, fighting to defend, you know, the, f the freedoms. There were today, you know, the peaceful casting of 13 ballots <laughs> to try to become speaker. But yet there are people, you know, many in that group creating that dynamic, the rebels, who um, are election deniers. And who, some of them who say that, you know, this is really a fiction about January 6th. And I, you know, just ask you how you feel about that. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I know how we all feel, but I'm very curious how you, all of you who were, who were there for it must feel. You know, and I, I'm sure every officer has, has their opinion. I will, I will tell you this. We are at a real bad place as a nation. I have never seen the fracture, the division that is out there. Think about it. We, we, we can't even handle simple votes. We can't even, and, and you see it, it's, you know, in Congress. You're seeing it now in school boards. You're seeing it now in community meetings. You're seeing it now at, at council hearings. We're better than that as a country. We really are. What happened to our moral compass? Um, you know, when I look at officers being beaten by blue flags, by people with, with the thin blue line flag, and my officers stop people, and as they were coming into the Capitol, they'd pull out their badge and go, hey, we're doing this for you. We're police officers. What do you mean you're doing this for us? Well, yeah, that's what the officers were telling me. They were disgusted. These are people that swore an oath, just like my officers did. Um, how did we get here? You know, that's just, it, it's just incredible to think that, you know, we're one of the greatest nations on the face of this earth. We have a great uh, government structure. And here we are, yeah. you know, and I, and I talk about that in my book. How, you know, how did we get to this? You know, in part of my book, I talk about, I, I finally felt that we we're, had gained enough control of the uh, of the capital, and gave, gained enough control of the capital, to where I could finally go over and brief Vice President Pence. Vice President Pence had been reaching out to me on several occasions to get an update, and he wanted an in-person update. Um, do you have the energy to read that section? Let me see what I can do. I, yeah, I'll set I'll set the stage, and then I'll try and I'll try and read it. It's a, it's a bit of emotional read, but I'll try and read it. Okay. Um, and and it's interesting coming. You know, I'd never done a book. I've done a thesis when I got my, uh, uh, my second master's, I'd never written a book. And when I talked to a couple of authors, I said, hey, I'm, I'm doing this book thing, what should I do? And he goes, you know what I do? He goes, the last thing I do is read. He goes, all, all the people coming to your book event, trust me, they can read. They're not coming to have you read a section. So I'd never thought I'd, I'd read a section, but you, you've talked to me about it a little bit. My wife, my wife who's in the background and, you know, helped me polish this as we, as, as we wrote it, you know, said there's, there's one section that maybe if you want to read it, that's the section. So I'll try and uh, set this up for you real quick. But I'm getting ready. Um, I've battled with the, the National Guard. They're not on the scene yet. We've got enough, mil we've got enough um, police on the scene that I feel that we've taken, that the tide has turned. You know, we're pushing people. We're methodically clearing the Capitol. Um, things are getting to where I feel that we're in a good position where I can finally go over. I've, I've denied him a couple of times because I couldn't leave. We had too much going on. But now I can go over and I can brief him on when we can get into Congress, when we can get him back into session. And we'll try no, we'll try and get it. We'll try and get it together. Here it comes. <laughs> this, these glasses are the result of this book. Not to say I've never worn, never worn, never worn readers. So let's see. Let me see what we do. So it's shortly after five, and I'm walking over to the Capitol from um, police headquarters. Police headquarters. Make sure you hold the mic. I'm going to. Um, I'm sorry. Police headquarters is on the north side of the Capitol. No, 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 that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm used to it. I say my wife's in the background in the last row. No, anyway. Um, so I'm walking over from police headquarters. It's on the north side of the campus. And I'm going in and I'm, I'm getting ready to walk into what's called the Dirksen Building. And when you read this, you're going to hear a lot about Lot 16. Lot 16 is where all our resources came into. <clears throat> so I'm walking over there to go brief the vice president. <clears throat> and I'm walking in to the Dirksen Building through the subway and into the Capitol. <clears throat> The marble floors of the hallway are wet with a mixture of chemicals and pepper spray, powder from fire extinguishers, vomit, and other bodily fluids. There is dust on the floor and walls. The once pristine hallways are littered with debris, broken furniture, flags, water bottles, and trash. I have
have never, I have never seen, nor can I ever have imagined, parts of the Capitol looking this way. All I can think is, how did this happen? How did we go from a demonstration to an attack on our government by angry Americans? I ran into officers on my way. Many are standing in groups, stunned and silent. They look dazed, as if they've been to hell and back. Their uniforms are covered with dirt and dust. Many look at me with a vacant expression, the thousand-yard stare, barely blinking. They have just been through a situation that we had never imagined, an attack on the Capitol by thousands of violent fellow Americans. I stopped to check on all of them. I, I stopped to check on all of them as much as I can as I walk through the halls. Many of the officers I recognize from my regular walks to the Capitol, others from recent graduating recruit officer classes. Many are, <clears throat> many are covered in stains from various fluids, their eyes red and swollen, tears and snot still running down their faces. They keep pouring water on their faces to wash off the stinging chemical cocktail with little relief. Uniforms are torn and missing badges and insignia lost in the attack. Uniforms that started the day midnight blue are wet, crusty, more gray than blue, and the crisp white shirts are stained shades of yellow, orange, red, and brown, each hue telling a story of a separate attack, a distinct incident involving another assailant and another substance. I can see that the officers are hurting physically, mentally, and emotionally. They're in shock and disbelief, trying to make sense of everything that had just happened, yet they are concerned enough to ask how I'm doing. The knot, in my <clears throat> the knot in my stomach that has been there ever since I first saw the officers on the outer perimeter getting hit has grown even bigger and more painful. Sad to say that knot's still there. The electric, buzz <clears throat> the electric buzz flowing through my body has not stopped, and it feels though as though it never will. I fight back tears seeing my officers in the Capitol looking this way. It goes on. It's, it, it's really tough to read and, and see what was going on, but... You know, these officers, I cannot tell you how many notes, how many texts I've gotten from these officers. Um, Any reaction from them to, the, uh, to you writing this book? Um, yeah, actually a lot of reaction. Um, today I've received do probably dozens ever since the book came out. Let me put it this way. I had 110 people show up at the book launch. A number of them were police officers. Was this in D.C.? This is in Washington, D.C. at Politics and Prose last Tuesday. I think it is. I've lost, I think, Tuesday. Um, so that means many of them picked up their books. Some of them read it in two days. They couldn't put it down. This, oh, excuse me. Yeah. What they're telling me is finally someone's telling our story. Someone's getting the truth out. Yeah. So my hat's off to them. I, I love every one of them. I do. Yeah. I miss them, but... <clears throat> They, they're very appreciative of, of writing it. Um, you know, this isn't, you know, me trying to cash in. This isn't me trying to glorify, you know, something that they went through. Um, all I want to do is see that not happen again. Right. You know, I, I do a lot of work. I've gone through the Naval Postgraduate School, Center for Homeland Defense and Security. They teach and they train a lot of the leaders around the country, uh, and I will be lecturing there um, because this, people need to learn what happened. People need to learn what not to have overseeing security and a structure in the police department so this doesn't happen again. We're almost out of time, so I have two more questions mm, for you. That's fine. Could it, could it happen again? You know, I'm, and, and I don't necessarily mean could the political forces be out there, though look at our Mark Twain Facebook and there were protesters um, as, as I drove in here earlier. I'm really ac asking, do you think that um, security has been heightened and um, uh, th that me measures have been taken to improve the communication that led to so many of the issues you had to deal with. You know, I, I, I hope so. I know the, the funding has come in, so, you know, specific stuff. And and again, the, the, the civil discourse, the, you know, your right to, to demonstrate, your right to put the signs out, I'm a firm believer in that. I have no problem w whatsoever. You, know, you should be able to do it in a civilized, civilized fashion. Um, so they've gotten uh, a lot more influx of, of money. 
they're starting to do some of the training so that the basic stuff that will help regular police department are in place under the, the person that replaced me uh, is a very experienced um, uh, chief a lot of experience within the Washington DC area he's doing the best he can but you still have the oversight structure that's going to be a nightmare for him and guess what um, it's you know it's it's a recipe for disaster and you know it'll, you know it'll you know something like that could, could happen again I'm concerned you know when you look at the where we are as a country you know it's just you know it's so divided you just never know whether it's you know the capital today the White House tomorrow you never know you just hope that the intelligence is going to be better you hope the Department of Defense is going to get their stuff together you know when you have the IG for them saying it's appropriate that doesn't give me a whole lot of credibility there are a lot of feeling of you know good feeling um, but I do believe that no matter what the officers are going to do what needs to be done like they did last time uh, and I just hope you know help as it comes a little sooner your future plans um, I love policing I really really do I absolutely positively love policing I'll defend the officers I'll support you know, I, I, I know we, you know, every once in a while you're going to run into a bad cop, and those are the ones you need to get off the streets. But our officers are doing a hell of a job. I don't know if I'll ever put on a gun and a badge again, but I do think that I do want to do something in a, with a foundation helping, you know, resilience um, officers that have gone through traumatic experiences. And what is unique about January 6th is every one of you probably watched this on a TV. How many of you were screaming at your TV? Where the hell is the backup? What's going on? Guess what? My family was doing the same thing. Every single one of my officers, every single one of my civilian employees, my, my, my secretary, people in my office, their family was like, oh, my God, this affected an entire department. But I do believe that, you know, executives, you know, officials, you know, people have different stress levels, and it affects them differently. So, you know, having the speaker go on national TV the very next day and call for your resignation and say, you know, there was a failure at the top, uh, and that I hadn't even called her. Y'all, did y'all hear that? I, I hadn't even called, I hadn't even talked to her since this began. And I talked to her three times. I talked to her with the vice president. I talked to her when she called me to confirm what the vice president, what I briefed the vice president on. And then when I called to brief all the leadership about when we can get them back into Congress. And then she told and then the nation the next day I hadn't even talked to her. Um, you know, I think that has a certain impact on someone, and I'd hate to see someone else go through that, but I, I, I looked at, you know, just help work with some of these foundations uh, to help resiliency both for officers, but also I think executives go through, you know, a, a certain level of stress. I feel bad with the guy in uh, the chief over in Idaho that's been having to work with the, the four college students uh, that guy killed. You know, anybody that goes through and sees anything like that, that's, that's, that's traumatic, and I, I know there's going to be people talking to them, but, you know, that's just a different level of stress. So that's what I, I look forward to doing. Chief Stevenson, thank you so much for joining Th thank us. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me here.